This program is a presentation of University of California Television. Your support makes UCTV's programming possible. Contribute online at uctv.tv slash support. Check out our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, at youtube.com slash UCTV Prime. Subscribe today to get new programs every week. It gives me great personal pleasure uh, to introduce our distinguished speaker today. And on behalf of, again, UC Health, uh, to be able to co-sponsor today's event with our friends here at UCSF. Uh, again, I'm the director of the California Health Benefits Review Program, uh, housed at the UC Office of the President. Now, CHBRT, which is our acronym, which those of you can you know, make fun of the, uh, the acronym uh, noise there, um, is a 10-year-old program that provides impartial analysis to the California legislature, driven by faculty and researchers from across the UC system uh, on the topic of proposed health insurance benefit mandate legislation. So our unique collaboration is intended to provide for better decision making in Sacramento using evidence-based uh, research and analysis within the, the uh, legislature's extraordinarily tight timeline. Now this kind of ability to form partnerships the ability to bring fresh viewpoints and academic rigor to decision makers and the political process, I think are really emblematic of the kinds of contributions that Dr. Altman has made for decades on pivotal healthcare issues facing the country. I fear we will still need him for quite some time ahead, uh, and I personally have had the great fortune to study under Dr. Altman and work for him. Now, Stuart Altman is the Saul uh, C. Chaikin Professor of National Health Policy at the Heller School for Social Policy and Management at Brandeis University. He is, I think, without uh, uh, any hesitation, everyone would characterize him as an internationally recognized health policy uh, expert. He served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare, Hugh, in the Nixon administration, and was one of the architects of President Nixon's plan for universal health care. Uh, Stewart was a child prodigy from the Bronx and clearly worked in the Nixon White House as a high school student, because... <laughs> Um, he also was President Clinton's health transition, uh, was on the Clinton's health care uh, transition team and was appointed to the President's Bipartisan Commission on the Future of Medicare, was a chairman of PROPAC. Uh, recently, he was a member of the health policy team for Barack Obama during his presidential campaign. And in between, he found time to be a dean, a president of Brandeis, and most importantly, he's been a true mentor and friend to countless politicians, students, and executives. I think I speak on behalf of everyone in this room and being delighted to hear his thoughts today and celebrate this remarkable new book, which I hope you all read. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Stuart Altman. Thank you, Garen. What Garen didn't say, uh, was probably one of the really highlights of my life was the year that I spent here in California, both teaching at the School of Public Policy and Public Health, and then coming across the bridge and fighting the traffic to join Phil Lee and Lou Butler in the Institute. It was, there you are, Phil. I was hoping you were going to be here. <laughs> oh, it's good to see you. This is a truly great opportunity. I, I really, I, I have to, you know, have Dorothy Rice, uh, when I first started uh, at HEW, yes, I was very young, just, just like Dorothy, we were, and, and I think I was there about an hour, and somebody said to me, there's one woman you have to meet. Her name is Dorothy Rice. 
you, because you, you should not try to do anything in healthcare without talking to her because she knows what's going on. Um, beginning of the whole statistical analysis, providing data for researchers, understanding the system. And Dorothy, thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, it's been a pleasure. And then my good friend, Steve Schroeder, who uh, um, over the years we, we, we were friends before. Um, I remember, Steve, when you were in Washington and we were in Washington together. And then he said he was coming out to California. I said, why are you going out there? I mean, you know, all the action is back in Washington. He said, I think there'll be a little action in California. And he was, of course, right. And then we spent time together here. And, and then uh, he went back to, um, to uh, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, where he, he told me I wasn't going to spend more than 10 years, but he sort of dragged it out to 12, but he came back here. And you, uh, the, Garen mentioned my, um, my sojourn as chairing PROPAC, and I said, I'm not doing that without Steve coming by, and he worked with me a little bit. So it's really a pleasure, and a number of others who have been students at Brandeis. So this really is coming home in a lot of ways. Uh, I was, I mean, between trudging up the hills of Berkeley and trudging up the hills of, of UCSF, my little heart is sort of a test being tested, and uh, so far I'm still in one piece. So. It, it, this is great. Um, it was 1977 when I was here, so 25 years ago. And um, you know, I was thinking much of the area, the Bay Area, is still the same. Um, and you know, much of the issues around healthcare are still the same too, which allows those of us who are getting a little slower, we don't have to work so hard, because the issues haven't changed. The words have changed. So we're going to talk about new words about old things, but a lot of what I'm going to talk about uh, this afternoon is the extent to which we can potentially learn from the past. Um, sometimes I think of myself as the ghost of healthcare reform past. You know, I just, I, I, you know, I don't want to sound pessimistic. I don't want to sound know-it-all. Uh, you know, particularly with 12-year-olds that are now dominating Washington again. Um, <laughs> you know, they look just like I did, for the guys. They, you know, they have a lot of energy and a lot of enthusiasm and no knowledge. I mean, th but uh, they don't have Dorothy there to help them out. <laughs> so I, 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 in a very real sense, I am going to talk about uh, the past and what it could potentially um, teach us about what we need to do in the future. As a matter of fact, I, as you see the title, you know, ACOs, I'm sure all of you are familiar with the Accountable Care Organization concept, uh, which is, uh, we used to call them integrated care, um, capitation, managed care, different terms around the same concept. And bundled payments, after all, are a kind of super-duper version of the DRG system, which it was a form of bundled payments, in a way, for hospital care. And so the question that I raised to myself is, uh, are ACOs and bundled payments the new, new thing? Um, or, and by the way, what happened to the old new things? Now, I do that because I'm a big Michael Lewis fan. Um, many of you, I'm sure, know Michael Lewis, Moneyball. He lives here in Berkeley, and, and uh, in honor of him, I didn't wear a tie because I've never seen him wear a tie. I do have a tie. I do own a tie. I got one. But, you know, I figured hey, if I'm going to talk about Michael Lewis. I had the privilege of sharing a, a program with him once, a phenomenal guy. Anyway, he wrote this book, The New New Thing. Not too many people know of him compared to Moneyball and, and uh, Liar's Poker and the like. But it really was, a, in the 80s, story of Silicon Valley on how, you know, they, they would always throw everything out that wasn't invented today or yesterday, and two days ago was old. And the question that I said is, well, you know, I, I, ha, is there really anything new about what we're doing? So when we think about what are the issues that we're dealing with, what are the issues that we worried about in 1971 and Phil worried about in 1945, I mean, and that if you go back and read the literature of the 30s, we were talking about the fact that we, we couldn't afford our healthcare system. 
and I tell this, and this group could appreciate more than, I came into Washington in 19, in a major way in 1971, and I think I was there a month. It was, I know, it was there a month, and I, I was just figuring out where the men's room was and the women's room was. I was just trying to get my way around. And then if you remember, President Nixon imposed wage and price controls in this country. And I, he did it on a Sunday thinking he would slide it through while no one was looking. And I think the only person that didn't know was me. I come into my office on Monday morning, and my assistant says, the White House wants to see you. Now, this was the era of Haldeman and Ehrlichman. People went to the White House and were never seen again. This was, <laughs> this was, <laughs> I don't care, I'm 32 years old. Anyway, I was pretty nervous. I went to the White House. Now, well, I got there, and sitting around the table were all the president's men. I'm sorry, there was no women there. Chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, Herb Stein, looks at me and says, Dr. Altman, do you know how much money we're spending on health care? And I did know because I had this young fellow that worked with me, Bob London, who had told me, because I didn't know either. He said, we're spending $75 billion on health care, and it's amounting to 7.5% of our GDP, and if we reach 8%, our whole way of life is going to deteriorate, and it's going to be your job to make sure that doesn't happen. So. The president wants me to control health care costs. I don't give a damn. I'm healthy. I don't care. And, and you know how successful I've been. We've gone from 70. <laughs> <laughs> we've got, I'll show you this slide later. We're 75 billion to 2.7 trillion from 7.5% of GDP to 17.5% of GDP. And somehow the world has not collapsed. It's gotten tougher. So when people ask me today, you know, what happens if we reach 18%? Uh, the truth of the matter is I'm falling apart and I really don't care. I want to make sure that the healthcare system is available to take care of me. So, but I do realize that, as I did then, that healthcare costs do impose restrictions on other things. I mean, here you are in the University of California, there's absolutely no question that there's a trade-off between the health care that you provide, but how much people pay for it, and the education that's available. States and counties are really hurting, the federal governments are. So, so we can't ignore this thing. And of course, what's the evil force that we all look to, which is the same evil force they look to in the 30s and in the 60s and in the 70s? which is how do you get rid of fee-for-service medicine and how do you introduce a new system. But as I said, this is not new. It was the cornerstone of the Nixon health plan. Now, many of you remember, and of course, Dorothy and I lived it, Nixon was an anomaly. I mean, he was not the most loved president of America, but when you go back and you look at what was done during the Nixon administration, it turned out to have been a pretty liberal agenda. And for those of you who are interested in reading the book, we go into detail about all the different things that happened, including the health care reform, and I'll talk a little more about that. And in fact, it was under the Nixon administration that the whole concept of managed care, or at that point HMOs, became a, a, a kind of a major policy issue. Uh, I had the privilege of serving with a fellow from Kaiser by the name of Scott Fleming. And Scott, I mean, I thought, this managed care stuff was a commie plot that had been, and what did I know? I was from the Bronx, I didn't know anything about health care. This stuff that was out in California was, I was a little nervous about all that kind of stuff, you know, everyone getting together and, and having a kumbaya and wanting all this care done together. I said, what else do they do when they're in those clinics? I mean, this was after the 60s, after all, and it came from California. I figured, well, maybe I should look into this. Um, but it was a major part of the policy to sort of introduce the idea of moving away from individual practices to fee-for-service. And of course, it became a big deal under the Clinton plan and managed care. So this idea of moving against fee-for-service is uh, not new at all. And yet, at the end, we failed. If we define its failure as using it as a mechanism to slow the growth in healthcare costs. Um, and the question is, why? Now, as I said, it's all in the book. You know, you can, uh, there's the book. <laughs> You're going to get a chance to buy it if you want. 
Um, I'm donating all my side to the university back, so it's not a question of my making any money on it. But it was a fun uh, ride to sort of go back and look at history. And I had a very good co-author, uh, David Chapman. And by the way, Steve, you are responsible because uh, I, you know, I had this big grant from the foundation, and I was looking around for someone to do the work, because left alone, I would never have gotten it done. And I hired this fellow, David Shackman, who turned out to be great. And then we became friends, and he wrote the book with me. So thank you again. Um, anyway, um, the question is, how did it work? By the way, while I'm involved with the book, um, I do want to say something about health care reform. Uh, and, um, and when I hear all the discussions today about how the Accountable Care Act is a socialized medicine and a takeover of government to take over the American health care system, I can't help but feel a little sick to my stomach because the reality of it is it's much more a evolution of where this country has been and far from a revolution. So we, um, in the book, systematically go through the provisions in the Accountable Care Act and compare them to what was in the Nixon plan in 1974, that was in the Dole Chafee, which was the alternative to the Clinton plan in the 1990s, was the basis for health care reform in Massachusetts, pushed by, yes, then Governor uh, Mitt Romney. And if you look at that list, you'll see all the yeses, how similar the Obama plan is at the end to what was in the Nixon plan, whether it's near universal, based on private insurance, an employer mandate, small employer subsidies, low income subsidies, expansions. They go right down the list. This is far from a revolution. And as I said, when you listen to the discussion going on, it, and then, you know, you, for those of us who lived history, uh, you say, well, what, what are you talking about? What's so revolutionary about it? Um, the individual mandate, like somehow we've never used mandates in our history, whether we were mandating that health providers, hospitals had to provide free care or that employers had to provide coverage for their workers, or that uh, the HMO whole movement was a result of a mandate that said if you're a, an employer and there's an HMO in your area, you have to make it available to your employees. So the idea of mandates and the idea of expanding coverage is far from new. So. Let's get back to the issue about the changes in the payment and the delivery system. Why is it so difficult to do away with FIFA service? Well, it turns out FIFA service is a very convenient way to pay for medical care. It's the way we pay for most everything else. Go to the movies, you pay for it. Go to a restaurant, you pay for it. Buy a car, you pay for it. And so the idea is you go get health care and you pay for it. Easy to understand, easy to administer. It's usually associated with freedom of choice on the part of providers. You pick where you want to go. You go there, they submit a bill. The payer, whether it's private or government, pays the bill. Simple. And it provides financial incentives to do more. Now, some of us say, well, maybe some of those services that are provided aren't necessarily good for your health. But for most of us, in spite of the rhetoric, most of us as patients believe more is better. Now, you know, those of us who are sophisticated realize that you know, having those extra tests really are dangerous. You don't need those drugs and so on and so forth. There may be more and more of the patients. But if you push the average patient, they want to make sure that they can have access to all the care that's available or what they read about in Newsweek or Time magazine or they saw on television. So this issue of FIFA service turns out to be very, uh, have a very long life and it has a way of sort of coming back. But this pressure to control costs is very real today and maybe even greater than it's ever been, although somebody asked me this morning at Berkeley, 
you know, how do how does it look to you today versus 20 years ago, 40 years ago? And it really doesn't look that much. In many respects, the employer community was more energized against high health care costs in 1989 than it is today. Remember Lee Iacocca getting up there, the head of Chrysler, and saying he was going to move all the production of cars to Canada, and, uh, and red polling I, when Bill Clinton became, was uh, going to be president, he was still president-elect, he had that economic forum, and red polling, who was the head of the uh, Ford Motor Company, went up there and said that if you don't control health care costs, manufacturing in this country are going to go kaput. So, um, I don't see that with the business community today. But in general, there is a lot of pressure. And again, the culprit is FIFA service. So what should we do about it? What should we replace FIFA service with? And the question, again, is our ACOs and bundled payments the new, new things? Are these going to be the mechanisms that will um, replace FIFA service. And I think you're all familiar with them, so I haven't you know, put a lot of slides together. ACOs are more bundled payments, uh, global payments, where a, an organized delivery system, whether it's the UC system or some group of physicians get together, provide all the care for a whole population. Or bundled payments, where you agree to provide a, a limited service, all the services around that, whether someone is some kind of cardiac, COPD, or diabetes, or some other, and, and you as a deliverer of care said, okay, I'll provide all the services associated with that. Or the new uh, experiment that Medicare is doing where the bundle is around a particular hospitalization and uh, a particular DRG, and then all the services, not only the hospital, but also the doctor, and more importantly, the post, um, post hospital. One of the things that is a big shock to most people, and we now have data at Brandeis, we've been doing a lot of work on bundled payments, is that the surprise that most hospital and doctors have about the fact that 60 to 70 percent of the bill of the expenditures is after the hospital, even for complicated procedures. People go to nursing homes, they, they uh, go home health care, and they wind up back in the hospital, and so on and so forth. So we have a list of all the procedures, and often it's more than 50% of the total spending is after the hospital. So these new bundles are much larger than just the in-hospital care that's in the DRGs. So the question is, before we go to ACOs and bundle payments, let's just take a little historical ride through some of the previous old new things, which many of us lived through. Remember health planning? We were going to set up around the country all these agencies, uh, Berkeley and Heller and other places trained thousands of mostly young people who were health planners to go out and make sure that we had the right balance of the number of hospitals and, and, and the, making sure there was mental health there and so on and so forth. And, and we had this apparatus that the whole country was going to be divided into these areas. I'll never forget my own personal experience. They put me in charge of allocating America in terms of these agencies. <coughs> Now, I had been west of the Hudson once at that point, and uh, so I didn't know all the nuances of what this country looks like. So all I had was a model, and the model said you needed to have a certain number of people in each area in order to qualify for these agencies. So based on this model, this careful econometric model that we had developed, which only had one variable in it, not much of an econom we decided that the state of Washington should have one planning agency. And so we had a draft plan with that in, and I got a call from the governor's office. And he said, uh, we, you've been, we've been told that you have one planning agency for the state of Washington. And I said, uh, yes, based on your population, uh, that's what you have. 
He said, do you realize that there's a mountain range that goes through the state of Washington and the people on the east have never been to the west? They are not allowed to go to the west. <laughs> they don't know where the west is. They're, they're, Seattle is a foreign country. And I said, no. I said, there's a mountain range of Washington? Did not know. <laughs> he said, you can't have one planning agency. So he said, OK, you can have two. We also decided that there should be no state of New Jersey. <laughs> that all the people in the north went to New York, and all the people in the southern part of the state went to Philadelphia. So why? Because we, we decided we were not going to be constrained by political boundaries, that we were going to do health care boundaries. Well, the, the governor of the state of New Jersey didn't take our views very, didn't like the idea that we had abolished the state of New Jersey. So anyway, we had to redo everything like that. And there were a lot of other places, you know, in Missouri and rivers and stuff like that. But we finally put together these planning agencies, and they were busy doing things. And we had certificate of need laws, which meant that you couldn't build anything unless you got approval. And these, these planning agencies turned out to be pretty tough. And it all worked perfectly for about a year or two. And then the fights developed. And all the hospitals that wanted to expand got consultants and lawyers. And, and it made a field day for consultants and lawyers and stuff like that. I, re I remember in Boston, <clears throat> there was this uh, second-rate clinic. I think it was called the Leahy Clinic. And they had the nerve. They wanted to build a hospital, a new hospital, outside of downtown Boston. Well, the powers that be at the Mass General and the Brigham and the Beth Israel said, we don't need another hospital. Why? And so they went to the planning agencies and they said, no, don't let them build. And then all the people in the suburbs said, we don't want to go to downtown Boston. We want a hospital there. And so you could just see the whole concept of health planning and certificate of need blowing apart. PSROs, where we're going to set up these things, we're going to be big things. Utilization controls and disease management, pay for all of these were very good ideas. There was, there's not a bad apple in that list, but every one of them failed. Were they all bad ideas? Why did they fail? I'll tell you why they failed. They failed because we lack the political will to make them succeed. What's sep it's not the technical aspects of controlling spending. We know how to do that. The question always is, when you try to do it, as you, there are going to be winners and losers. There is no way to control health care costs without controlling health care spending. And health care spending means people's jobs like here, or people's health care. And the losers are much more conscious of the loss than the winners. And ultimately, at, to this point, the losers have been successful in preventing the system from winning. The other thing is we tend to do them one at a time. We'll come up with certificate of need, health planning, DRGs, but we do them one. And the truth is that none of them are powerful enough. So the net result is this. This is America. This is health care cost growth. The question is, what are we going to do? So let's just focus on a few of these innovations and see why they may not have succeeded, and then see if we can draw any lessons. So that maybe this time, life will be a little easier or better. So my first and favorite, of course, is DRGs. I had the privilege of chairing PROPAC, which was the advisory group to set these things up. You know, but it shows you how smart I was. The week before it passed, I, I said, government will never do this, never do it. And I was out of the country when they passed it, so they made me the chair. Um, so anyway, I had a great ringside seat to the DRG system. So as I said, DRGs were only for inpatient hospital care. So it excluded um, outpatient care. It excluded physician. Physician services were going to come next. 
But then the physicians took one look at the DRGs and said, we don't want them for physician services. So they managed to destroy that idea. No one thought that it was important to include post-acute, but as I said, it turns out to be a very important part of the whole healthcare spending system. And we also thought that once Medicare did it, everybody else would do it. Well, it turns out private insurance decided they didn't want to do it. I had this fellow, Len Schaefer, on, um, you in California may know Len pretty well, uh, ran Blue Cross at WellPoint and all that kind of stuff. He was on there, and, and when we said, well, we're going to try to extend the DRG system to all private insurance, he said, you're out of your mind. You're crazy. You shouldn't do that. Why shouldn't you do it? It's working so well. That first of all, it's not working so well. Second, we have a better mousetrap. We don't want your DRG system. We'd rather, because your DRG system is made of averages, and we want to beat the averages. Anyway, private insurance didn't adopt the DRG system until recently. So um, it, it was primarily Medicare. So here's the DRG system, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I just want to spend a few minutes on a couple of issues that are really turn out to be fun. There is this group in Medicare they call the Office of the Actuary. They are the power. They are the people that set rates. They do things. Strange group of people. <laughs> nice group of people, but they are powerful. And the Congress gave them an impossible responsibility. They said, we're fundamentally changing the way we're going to pay for Medicare. Prior to that, Medicare paid on a cost basis. Every hospital got a different amount for the same service, depending on their own cost structure. The more days you stayed in the hospital, the more you got paid. And we all know that the 10th day is really a lot less expensive for the hospital than the third day or the second day. And so there was a lot of financial incentives to keep people in the hospital longer. Um, and so they fundamentally changed it under the DRG, or prospective payment system, and said, we're going to pay you one amount for the whole hospital stay. And they said to the actuaries, your job is to figure out how much we should pay for those admissions such that the two systems would look exactly the same, so that it would be, quote, unquote, budget neutral. So the actuaries, who were a pretty smart group of people, said, now, wait a minute. How are, you, how, how, how are you doing this? They said, well, it's based on these categories of illnesses, and we're putting them into categories, and we're calling them diagnostic-related groups. And, and, and they said, well, where did you get these groups? They said, well, we've been studying how hospitals treat patients over the last couple of years. They said, but now, the hospitals are going to get paid based on which group they put a pe person in before. It was just a statistical analysis. So that means that people are going to move those codes such that people are going to be in higher paying DRGs. People said, oh, no. That's, the medical community would never do a thing like that. <laughs> So the actuary said, OK, we're going to add 3%, assuming that there is this extra coding up. Now, just to give you some orders of magnitude, 1% off was $400 million. Well, it turned out that it wasn't 3%. It was 9%. In other words, the, the, the coding, we, we began to call it coding creep or coding gallop. The coding moved patients into the higher rates. And none of us in government knew it for about two years. I got a call one day. I was at Brandeis. I got a call from a reporter in, in Houston, Texas. And the reporter said, I've been doing an analysis of the, the, the teaching hospitals here in, in Houston. And they're making a lot of money under Medicare. I said, oh, no, no, that's not possible. This thing is budget neutral. And each DRG is supposed to pay just what the costs are. No, it's not possible. She said, well, you look at my numbers, because I don't want to publish this. But they're earning between 10 and 20 percent margins on these things. So she sent me the data, and of course, I didn't know what I was looking at, so I immediately sent it to the staff at PROPAC and also at, at Medicare. And after a while, we figured it out. 
and the government giveth and the government taketh away. And so well, you see what happened. And gradually they pulled away all the money. And by the late 1980s, Medicare was paying less than costs. And we had this period of time. And then we had the great 90s when we had the battle between the Republicans and the Democrats. And cost actually flattened out, but Medicare payments continued. And then we had the, um, the Balanced Budget Act of 1997. And eventually payments came down again. So if you look at the history of DRGs, they've been above, below, above, below. Now they're below. And there are fewer and fewer hospitals that are making money on Medicare. And I suspect if we go through the books of UCSF or, or any other hospitals, there, there are very few that are actually making money on Medicare. Even teaching hospitals, which got a big bump in the beginning, are now losing money. So in some sense, DRGs worked, but they worked in a very narrow range. And as I said, they pushed a lot of patients out into the outpatient department. They pushed a lot of patients out into post-acute. They got people out quicker, but they ran up the bill in the nursing home and so on. So when you look at total spending, didn't have much of an effect. And actually, at the end of the day, the whole thing is still, turns out, it's still functioning, but it's not saving the kind of money people expected. Then, of course, there was managed care. Now, as a big believer in managed care, we were going to put people in, and we were going we to manage care and put to make the thing work better. People were going to get better quality care, and they're going to get and and we were going to and we were going to save money. And everybody wanted to save money, so we thought. As it turned out, managed care was more successful than most people wanted. As a matter of fact, it was so successful. Most people hated it. Managed care became managed costs because it was much easier to just cut costs than it was actually to manage care. That's hard. And that you really couldn't measure quality. We have a much better way of measuring quality today. So it was much easier to just save money. And one of the things that Scott Fleming and the Kaiser people told me was the motto at Kaiser was that we didn't want anybody in Kaiser that didn't want to be there. Because you had to decide you were going to go to clinics. You had to decide that you were going to have a limited number of patients, a uh, limited number of doctors. And you had to decide you were going to be part of it. Not everybody wants to do that. And that was the model of managed care. Well, in the 90s, millions of Americans were forced into into managed care by their employers. And they didn't want to be there. So here's the managed care environment. So as we got down here into Clinton, as you remember, didn't quite make his health care reform. Poor Phil had to live through that again. <laughs> but managed care really hit its own because the insurance people, the managed care people, went to the employers and said, if you put all of your workers into one plan, our plan, we will guarantee you that your premiums will not go up or will go up by 1% or 2%. Ironically, ironically, the insurance companies and the managed care people actually received less revenue than the cost fell. Cost did fall but not as much as the revenue. And what's ironic about it is insurance companies and managed care companies actually lost money during the heyday of managed care. But we hated it. And ultimately, managed care was destroyed by the four Ps. First, providers, doctors, hospitals. Didn't like the idea that they were being second-guessed. We as patients didn't like the idea that we were being told by our doctors that we were being denied services that were needed, but that the blankety-blank insurance companies wouldn't pay for it. Then it was the press, movies and television and, and, and newspapers attacking men, and finally the politicians. So by the end of the 90s, managed care was kaput. Now, the people that didn't like managed care said, we can destroy managed care, and it will have no impact on health care spending. How wrong they were. 
how wrong they were. And the irony again is that the insurance industries, the ones that were beat up, the managed care companies, actually made more money after the end of managed, look at it, what happened. This is the revenue that flowed to American insurance companies while the costs only went up this much. Insurance companies made a fortune with the end of managed care because they figured out it was much easier to raise premiums. So they said, you want to go to a specialist? Fine. You want to go to two? Fine. You want a blue MRI rather than a yellow MRI? Fine. You want, you want to spend an extra day in the hospital? Fine. We don't care. We'll just raise premiums. And that's what they did. Now, of course, we're in an environment where premiums are jumping around and costs are so that, but this was the heyday of private insurance. So again, managed care as we knew it in the 90s was destroyed. And during this period of time, the consolidation that was going on, the closing of hospitals, the reduce, reductions in length of stay eventually stopped. The, the, all the marriages, the combining of hospitals into systems, the divorces exceeded the marriage rate. We had more uh, hospitals breaking apart from systems than we had hospitals forming systems. So much of the value, and there was a lot of value in that period, was just thrown out as we proceeded back to FIFA service and back to a disorganized system. So what does all this have to do with the ACOs and bundle payments? Can we avoid errors of the past? Should we avoid them? So what are these errors? First of all, and California is a poster child for all the good and bad of what happened in the 90s. Large numbers of physician groups and hospital groups took on more risk than they knew what they were doing. All of a sudden, groups like hospitals and physicians were asked to take responsibility for a whole population without any knowledge, really, and any data on what that population uses in form of health care. Because after all, what do you know? You know when somebody comes into the hospital, you know what they use, but you don't know what they're using out of your hospital, whether it's in another hospital or with the physicians or post-acute care. And now you're going to have a global payment, a managed care capitation rate that is responsible for the whole group. And you were asked to take on much more risk than you were capable of taking on. Individuals, as I said, were forced into plans that they didn't want to be in. And it didn't take them a lot to sort of begin to complain because they didn't want to be there in the first place. And what was even more, patients felt that they were being guinea pigs and that the money that was being saved was either going into the insurance company's pocket or into their employers. And that they were not benefiting from these lower spending rates. They were just paying the price. And so they didn't like that. And then finally, as I said before, quality of care was really not an issue. It was not really being measured. And as I, the issue about which plan you went into was almost entirely based on costs. So where are we today and what can we, what have we benefited, if anything? In the Accountable Care Act, in the health care reform, there are these proposals and actually plans. One of them is the ACOs. And in the ACO model, that's now the law, it's what we call shared savings as opposed to risk bearing, where we say to a group like yours, or the government says, if you go into this and you beat the benchmark, we will share, we the government, will share the savings with you. Of course, people have a different opinion about how much the sharing should be, who should get more. But if you don't beat the benchmark, so be it. There's, it's only a one-sided risk. If you want to take the other side, you can. But you can put your toes in the water. Maybe take the, go the water up to your ankles or your knees. But you don't have to jump into the middle of the lake or the ocean. Don't take on more risk than you know what you're doing. 
which is a direct result of the, what happened during the 90s. Maybe we'll, you know, let's learn more about what it's like to be responsible for a whole population before you jump in. And what's more, we, the government, will help you. This has never been done before. For the first time, Medicare now will send the tape of all of the services that people that are on your response have used over the last two years. Never done before. So you will see as a group, and many, maybe you, this organization has done, if you want to go into the bundled payment experiment or the ACO experiment, you will have information about the, the care that is used by that population, which is a good thing. Patients. Patients cannot be locked in to the ACOs. Now, many providers are uncomfortable with this. We have a system in Massachusetts which is being supported by um, the government. And I happen to now be on the Tufts Medical Center board. And we're very nervous about this because we have responsibility for a patient population. But if that patient, when they get sick, decide to jump out of our network of doctors or the hospital and go into another network, they can. We can't force them to stay. And yet we are responsible. So if, you know, if our, if, you know, dread of all dreads, they get sick and then they decide they want to go to the Mass General, we have to pay <laughs> the Mass General out of our capitated rate. It's good for the patients because they don't feel locked in. They don't feel, and as a result, they, they are not so antagonistic to the idea. It's not always so good for the providers, but it's there for a specific reason. It's there not to repeat the problems of the 90s. And to that extent, it's a good thing. I'm not sure it should stay that way, but in the beginning, it makes sense. And then finally, every one of the plans, whether it's our, we have this Blue Cross plan, which is, or the government plan, half of the money that is going to come in the form of extra money is going to come only if the plan exceeds benchmarks on quality. The quality measures need to get better. Many of them have been developed here in the research group or at Brandeis and, or around, and they're much better than they were in the 90s. And at least they're gonna be used. Big fight about what those measures are. So here are the three attempts to learn from the errors of the past. Now, do I believe that the ACL model as currently developed is gonna save a lot of money? No. But it's a learning tool. Do I believe that um, you can really continue to do this with shared savings? No. I think ultimately the system is going to require health delivery systems like yours to take more risk. And then finally, do I believe that patients shouldn't be, I believe patients that ultimately have to be part of a system and agree to be, to take care under that system. But let's start out slowly. So. That's where we are today. As I said, I've talked about this. It's all in the book. Um, and uh, with that, I will stop. Thank you very much. And we have time for questions, and people can, then we can talk about a lot of other things. Medicare, the Supreme Court, all that good stuff that's going on. Anybody want to jump in? How do we build prevention into this whole system? How do we build prevention into the system? Well, two things I would say about that. First, we really need to, uh, while I'm a big fan of prevention in the long run, unfortunately there's not a lot of evidence that it has short-term payoffs, so we need, to get, we need to get people and organizations to have a long-term view about this. So you need to get the financial arm linked up with the, the prevention arm. Um, because ultimately, if we can ultimately, if we could stop people, you know, if we can help people from not getting sick. Um, but it's a long-term process. And unfortunately, a lot of these organizations have short-term memories. So what we're trying to do is to get the payment system to have a long tail to it. And then you can bring prevention into it. The other way to do it 
and we, the ACO is doing is certain services that are uh, judged to be good in the short run have no deductibles, no coinsurance, get special. But you know what? It's not strong enough. So if you have a better way of doing it, more, you know, let's figure out a way to do it. Because, I mean, we talk about, you know, I know Steve has been involved with smoking. And, you know, clearly we know. I mean, he knows. I mean, he's taught us, you know, about the value of doing that. And, we, you know, it seemed like we were doing a pretty good job. Lately, it's getting tougher again. I see too many young people smoking. I know you're working hard to change that. Stu, how long do you think it'll be before we'll go to a single payer? You know, Phil, I, I've said that, uh, you know, and, and it, it's tongue in cheek, you know, about the guy, the analyst who goes up and asks God the same question, and God said, absolutely going to happen, just not in my lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Amer look, Phil, you know, I'm not opposed to a single payer system. I can see the values of it. We are hanging by our fingernails to hold on to this incremental, incremental, change, important incremental change. And it's not at all clear to me sitting here in mid-March that in, by July or August we will even have that. So, you know, you know better than I, this country is so divided. It is terrible. Now, some people say, maybe more cynical, Let's destroy the ACE Accountable Care Act because the alternative has to be single payer. And it's possible that the only way we will go to single payer is a total financial collapse of the system. Is there a point at which the world will collapse? And the related question is, uh, another friend of Brandeis, Robert Rice, wrote in his recent book, Aftershock, about the parallels between the economic uh, pressures during pre and post depression and pre and post now. Um, and that in the Depression, things were just so bad that it created the will to change things. And now the pressures have been taken off just enough with big business and banks and whatnot that have prevented the real changes that need to take place in the economy. So I'm wondering if there's something similar with health care. You, know, you, you know, he may be right, and, and what I said before may be right. And that is, first of all, I have no idea what the number is anymore. I mean, I would have bet. I would have bet two of my three kids that we would never have hit 10 percent. 10 percent seemed like a number that was so high. Now we're at 17. I don't know what the number is. I do know. You don't have to be very smart to know that this, these financial pressures are affecting many segments of our society. And if it continues to grow, at 2.5% greater than GDP, we're going to hit it. But is it 18%, 20%, 25%? I don't know. Um, so the getting back to Bob Reich's, yeah, uh, it, I'm not overly optimistic that we've put together the tools yet to slow it down. And it's possible that we will tip over. Um, and then single payer or something like that because that's the easiest way to control the whole system. Have one spigot, that's what other countries do, and then they can control the flow of dollars. Politically, it's very difficult where you have a country that is so divided. There's California, and there's Massachusetts, and a few others, and then there's the whole rest of the country. Strange world that we live in. So I don't know, but it's, it's, a, it's a fair question. And, and, you know, Bob's a smart guy, and I, and I generally think he's right. It's often chaos and, and massive problems that creates change. I've ironically, I've started to believe that what's really driving a lot of the opposition is, ironically, fear of real competition based on quality and so forth. It's not socialism and all of that, but if you really start tying quality measures and reimbursement down, then people have to get very serious about following guidelines and all these kind of things, which is really, you know, it hasn't really happened before. And that's, I think, what's causing a lot of the panic and what's causing a lot of the money flowing into these groups that are fighting it and all the propaganda that's coming out. So I wonder what you... Well, you know, when we look at the... I don't... I don't uh, know. I don't. I think the opposition is being funded primarily by by really right wing groups that uh, 
are totally opposed to government involvement. They don't want to pay for their brother. They, there are so many reasons. The, the largest single group opposed to health care reform are seniors over the age of 65. And why? Because they've been told that the Accountable Care Act will destroy Medicare, which is just a lot of crap. Um, no, I don't, but I don't disagree with the end of yours, which is that change among the delivery system brings fear. And you're absolutely right about the consultants. Um, I'm trying to get in on that myself. Um. <laughs> so how do we get 30, 40, 50, whatever million people you number you take into Medicaid, Medi-Cal, where the money is bad there, but also where we don't, it, by all projections, have the primary care people in the future to take care of them? I mean, we're sitting in the nursing school, unless we let nurses practice you know, much more too. But I mean, all the projections I see is we're just not going to have the care capacity in many parts of the country to to fulfill what the uh, health reform is supposed well, to do. Well, I'd say a couple of things. First of all, let me be the optimist. Um, we need to change the way we practice medicine. And we are in the nursing school. And the truth of the matter is a lot of primary care does not have to be given by a physician. And we still have archaic state laws in terms of who can practice where. Um, I recently was in the hospital, and much of the care was given by uh, nurse practitioners and physician assistants. Um, I don't know where all the residents went, you know. <laughs> in, speaking of, I mean, I expected to be treated by a lot of residents. I wasn't. Um, but Massachusetts is a pretty liberal state in terms, but even we have restrictions. So the primary care is a problem, and we have, since we have universal coverage in Massachusetts, and it, the primary care issue is real, so I don't want to downplay it. Um, and if we don't change the way we practice medicine, it will be a huge problem. So again, using your optimism, the pressure for making care. But that is one of the reasons why the haves fear this law. They have been told that they, them, are going to get access to your health care, and your health care is going to be worse. So if you talk to people, they say, it's going to cost, what are the, you know, I just, they asked me, what are the three arguments that are the most negative about health care reform? It's going to decrease the quality and access to my health care. It's going to cost so much money that it's going to break our bank. And why should we help them out when they're not working and doing this kind of stuff like that? And as I said, the Medicare, the over 65 population, is the single largest group opposed to health care reform. And when you listen to the rhetoric, it's that $500 billion is being taken out of the Medicare program to pay for it. Now, technically, that's true. But what it didn't say was that over a trillion dollars is going to go in to the hospitals. So anyway, um, uh, and the issue about Medi-Cal is real. But most of the new money is going to come from the federal government. But um, And for a hospital that's already like you see, which is probably already providing 4 or 5% of free care. The idea that even if they get 50 cents on the dollar, it's better than nothing on the dollar. So, Stu, yeah. isn't it time that you came back to UCSF? I'd love to. <laughs> Don't push me too hard. It wouldn't be hard. I, as I said, uh, first of all, I'm, I'm been, I was taking, telling Garen, I, I really miss this world, but I, I could not have found a better home than at Brandeis and the East Coast. But uh, I'll come back anytime you'll invite me. Thank you very much. It's nice. a deal. All right. Thanks.